As a wise Mad Titan once said, reality is often disappointing. This rings especially true in the world of astrophotography. We can create spectacular and dazzling masterpieces like these with the help of our specialized telescopes and cameras. But that's just it. This is what our camera can see, whilst this is what we can actually see with our naked eye. Now it's not a lie, the universe really is how it looks in these images our cameras capture. But with the aid of long exposure photographs that are generally captured over periods lasting hours, sometimes days, you can see a lot more than you can with just your eyes as they process the information you're seeing at a rapid speed. So today's video is the first of a two-parter, in which I'll be showing you precisely what the night sky actually looks like. I'm Damon Scotting, and this is Astronomical. It's a tale as old as time. The desire to share your view of a moment has challenged us since the dawn of human civilization. Until a couple of hundred years ago, the best way to show someone what you've seen was to draw it which, let's face it, wasn't always an accurate representation. Then we leveled up and introduced photographic plates into the mix, which gave us almost uncanny views of what the night sky actually looks like for a telescope. But then naturally, we advanced well beyond our wildest dreams and started to capture things that even our expertly designed eyes could not. In fact, imaging in different wavelengths seemed to open our eyes to viewing entirely different universes. But let's dial it back to the real deal. This is what the average human sees from their back garden when stargazing. Just over here, that red point of light, that is Mars. And then if we come over to the right, a little bit higher over here, we can see the constellation of Orion the Hunter. That right there is Orion's belt. That's Betelgeuse, which is about to go supernova any second. And this is the Orion Nebula. Let me zoom in a little bit. That faint fuzzy patch of light just below the belt. There you go, that's a stellar nursery. That's where stars are born. Now, if I pan up a little bit higher over here, look at that. On the left, you can see the biggest planet in our solar system. That right there is Jupiter. And then you can see the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters, nice little star cluster, followed by a 50% illuminated moon. Now, there are four things that are going to heavily influence the number of stars that you see. Number one, light pollution. Here's how the night sky looks from a pristine Bortle 1 sky versus how it looks from my Bortle 6 garden, which, all things considered, is still really good. Number two, the moon. In order to see the stars, we need it to be dark, right? Well, in which case, the antithesis to a starry night is a giant celestial body that reflects the sunlight, which is precisely what the moon does. When the moon's out, it really does wash away a lot of the stars in our night sky. Number three, the weather. It's a no-brainer that clouds interfere with your view of the night sky, but an overlooked aspect of stargazing is those annoying pesky cirrus clouds. These make it seem like everything's fine and even let us see the stars, but it's actually a really poor filtered view. Then, lastly, and perhaps more important than all of the rest, is patience. If everything goes right for you, then this is what you can expect to see, but not without patience. This is what you can see in our night sky without any light pollution. It's important to allow up to 30 minutes for your eyes to adjust to the dark sky. 95% of casual stargazers will step outside for a minute and look up, only to be underwhelmed. But the environment you were just in was likely a well-lit room, which means your pupils were contracted. The key to unlocking the universe is to allow yourself time to transition between your views. So assuming you do have the patience of a saint, and you've convinced your brain to go 30 minutes without keeping up with the Kardashians or doom scrolling, then this is a very good representation of exactly what you will see in December at 10 p.m. assuming you live somewhere with Bortle 6 skies. Now I'm going to start off by looking south where you will see the constellation of Orion the Hunter because if you move up towards the top right hand corner of this constellation you will see a bright star like point that is in fact the planet Jupiter. If you go even higher than that to the left you're going to see a red planet which we all know as Mars but then what's really cool at the moment is that if I point the camera back towards the house and I zoom out and take about 20 steps backwards you're going to see a crescent moon alongside the planet Venus. Look how bright Venus is. In order to achieve this view I have customized my camera settings to closely replicate our view of the night sky but the limitations of our human eye mean that we can't resolve these objects anywhere near as well as a telescope 
Europe can, which is such a shame because we really are on the cusp of seeing the true beauty of our night sky. So just for fun, I'm going to show you what it would look like if we could double down on our POV. This is what the night sky would look like if our eyes had two times zoom. Can you imagine how much love and appreciation we would all have for the night sky if we had been able to view its secrets in this level of extra detail? The likes of the Orion Nebula and Andromeda Galaxy have been mistaken as faint fuzzy cloudy patches of light in our night sky for far too long before the developments of the telescope. Who knows what early conclusions our ancestors would have drawn about these cosmic wonders with views only two times better than what we currently possess. The Seven Sisters would have likely been regarded as the Seventy Sisters, Countless humans would have looked up at the wandering stars or planets and questioned why one of them seemed to have four fainter points of light dancing around it. And some of our ancestors would have undoubtedly drawn the conclusion that the milky cloudy appearance of the Andromeda Galaxy was actually a heavenly plane that awaits us once we pass into the afterlife. I mean right now I'm showing you two times vision from a Bortle 6 location. Imagine what people would have seen hundreds of years ago where everywhere was Bortle 1. I started off this video by stating that when it comes to stargazing, reality is often disappointing. But that's only for those who come into this expecting to see views like this. For the rest of you who are patient enough and pick the right spot to stargaze from, you will see some incredible sights. And maybe if you are lucky enough, you will see wonders like these. Thanks for watching, next time I'll be showing you some side by side comparisons of what you can really see for a telescope, so make sure you're subscribed for more. I'm Damon Scotting, and this was Astronomical.